I've met my match. Uh, I think it's, I begin to think of Steve as the Ferris Bueller of uh, seeds. Yeah. And if you, if you're, it, oddly, if you've never seen Ferris Bueller's Day Off, you uh, got to see this movie. So Ferris Bueller uh, was talking about his friend Cameron, uh, and it said Cameron is so uptight that if he took a diamond in his ass, he'd, you know, if he took a piece of coal in his ass, he'd have a diamond in two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> uh, which is like kind of, you know, we had a problem, you know. Our problem is, as Steve was saying, corn is plastic, you know, and what that really means is that plants in general are willing to pretty much do what we want, what we ask of them. They're uh, teachers in that way, they're mirrors. So in plant breeding, you can ask plants to do a lot of things. And plants will be usually kind of obliged given time, and even if not given time, sometimes forced. And uh, they'll say, you sort of reap what you sow. You know, you'll get what you, what you, what you decided upon. So w some of the generics, when we say the word corn, when we say corn pollen does this or corn does that, corn is not one thing. Every corn is different. You, every corn variety has different type, a different weight of pollen. Every type of corn will have a different type of stalk. Every type of corn will have a different type of, uh, you know, ear. And we need to not generalize just like we need not to generalize about each other. So that we can easily lump, put corn into popcorn or flint corn or dent corn, but then there's every single variety that has been adapted to a particular place or a particular mm -hmm. farm or a particular person, a particular clan or tribe that selected or grew it in a certain way or used it in a certain way. So there is no one all-purpose corn. There's going to be corns that are going to be good for two of five things, or two of ten things, or three of five, you know. But there's not going to be any one corn that's going to be good for all these things. So we're kind of stupid, and we like to try to make things good for everything, and inherently like miss the whole point, you know. And when we try to breed things, we try to m try to get it to do what we think is important. The ten things we think are important are not the ten things that are important for the longevity of the human race, nor for agriculture, nor for corn. So an example of this is that we have a lot of corn being grown in straight rows. Thousands and thousands of acres of corn being grown in straight rows in Maine with high levels of fertilizer and herbicide. That corn can't perform. That type of corn cannot perform <coughs> without that treatment. If you try to grow that corn without fungicide coatings, without impregnated pesticides, without herbicide, without rows, without high levels of fertilizer, it's not going to grow. It's not going to do anything. Okay? It's not really adapted to here. But whatever it is, whatever we've asked it to do, we've asked it to kill insects, to eat available nitrogen, to grow a certain way and yield a certain thing which does not have very, which basically doesn't have any nutritional value. So we've been improving corn for the last 50 years and somehow have gotten ourselves into such horribly messed up bottlenecks that we keep having, but every time we get to a bottleneck we have to reach back to this to f fix the problem. And we're such in such a hurry that, you know, plant breeding takes 10 or 20 years to get something really good. Because you have to select it, and you have to be aware of it, and you have to watch it, and you have to work with it. And corn in particular is so malleable that you have to be really engaged and very knowledgeable about the, for the, the parent lines. So even if you're creating a hybrid, the person that has created these or selected the parent lines that get crossed to create a hybrid. So folks probably don't quite understand the process related to what's called open pollinated and hybrids, where open pollinated corn is most of pretty much what we've all been talking about today. And that's corn that all of the corn in the field are individuals. They're not clones. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
So even though they appear to be like have the same color kernels or the same type of growth habit, they're not the same. There's quite a bit of what we call heterozygous, which means basically genes that are not paired up in a specific alignment or that are sort of, they're not what we, we, what we think of as important. Um, but it appears that every one of those Byron Frentcorn ears is the same or very similar, but they're not identical. And we're allowing a broad range of diversity so that the plant can adapt itself as we move it through different farms, as, the, as we talked about the history of how that particular corn jumped around. It's going to actually adapt itself, meaning that when you select those ears, there's going to be plants that produce ears of a certain vigorous type that maybe where they were 100 miles before, they didn't produce those vigorous ears. Different plants are going to be throwing this genetics around and you're going to be finding the things that work for you and kind of moving those forward through how you use it. You know, so you, it might have been a corn that was used for hominy, but if you don't use it for hominy and you use it for something else, eventually you're going to find, figure out how to use it for this other thing and you're going to select towards the use. Mm -hmm. So there's the use, there's the region. So open pollinated mm -hmm. corn is very malleable. Okay, it's also requires attention. It requires care. Which because only 1% of the population is growing corn or farming, as we call it in America, <laughs> the rest of us aren't paying any attention. We're thinking somebody else is paying attention. And so the people that are paying attention are people that are trying to give us what we think we want in our society, which is generally a horribly reductive perspective about food and we're just basically just want to go to work and get a paycheck and not worry about how stuff works. That's kind of where we've gotten. That's sort of like politics. It's not politics. <laughs> <laughs> We're all responsible. <laughs> because there's only 1% of people doing this and there's only 1% of people farming who are working with seed. So the 1% of the 1% are the folks that are trying their best to meet our little eager, quick response demands. And so they've been working with corn as best they possibly could to take the good traits, say for an example of a Byron, they may say these, this one particular plant in this mm -hmm. one field is super vigorous, super awesome, super productive, seems to have a little bit of disease resistance, we're gonna take a snapshot of that. And we're gonna try to create a pure line and we're gonna take a snapshot of another corn and we're gonna cross those. And so that's where you get a hybrid. So a hybrid is a replicable set of genes where you've eliminated a bunch of that kind of malleability, that adaptability, and you've focused it to a result that gives you a consistent row of corn, a consistent field of corn with consistent yield. So when we were talking about the hand pollination, there was sort of the corn is coming out at different times. That's not true in hybrid corn. Boom. All tassels and all silks. Synchronicity, boom, crops already at the same time. It's numbers, baby. I want to go in that field. I want to cut all that crop. I want to get it in the barn. It's done. It's not about using your hands. It's about doing the math. Our society loves math. Guess what the word math comes from? The word math comes from the word mow. Mow. Aftermath means what happens after you mow a field. What'd you cut? What'd you get? What was the yield? Math has to do with yield. So we're all about math in our society. We're all about getting the most out of everything. Every little bit, okay? Pigs oink. So, you know, to do that, you sort of throw away a bunch of stuff. But when we've been doing all this work, all these heirloom corns, we're like, why did this all get thrown away? Well, you know, we're in a hurry. We don't really want to have everybody farming. We want to work in offices and not hurt our backs and whatever we're doing, you know? Can't swipe on our cell phones when you're starving to death, stuff like that. Um, Got to have food, so we figure out a way to make this cool stuff that's consistent, just like we all have consistent clothes with consistent <coughs> stitches made by machines. Corn, same thing. Stitches. We want to make corn. We want to make corn the same. We want to make it predictable. We want to make it all resistant to diseases. We want to make it not what Steve's people were making it, which is really like 
it's a neighbor, it's a part of the family. Mm. We want to go out in the field and we want to get what we want out of that. We don't want to listen to the corn. Okay, we're getting the corn to do what we want to do. And corn's like, sure. You're not going to like it. <laughs> but I'll go along with what you want. <laughs> so these, all these heirlooms were the source of all these lines originally that became these hybrids that are now what everyone grows. So it's not like those things just appeared out of nowhere. We captured wonderful things out of various different varieties from all kinds of different parts of the world and brought those traits into sort of concentrated sets of traits that now we're like, these are really, you know, really important for us. Corn that's straight, corn that stands up. There's no tillers. Tillers are something where corn, old corn, produces multiple stocks. And the, like, new corn doesn't do that. Can't run, can't cultivate that. That's a pain. Mm. Takes the focus away from the thing we want. We want big ears, two of them, straight corn, rows, all the same, harvest the same time, all those things. <coughs> but along the way, we basically stopped taking care of all the other the corns that were the source of the genetic material. So we've extracted what we want, and we threw away what we didn't want, or we put them in a germ bank, or people just stopped growing them. So the shoebox, at someone's choice, should not do what grandpa or grandma did. That's our choice as a society. Someone else is taking care of that for me. I'm going to go get a job. So there's all this wonderful corn, you know, that comes out of the seed companies. Seed companies, you know, this is, this is who's responsible for our wonderful food supply. And I can tell you, I know a lot of folks in the seed world. I know folks that work for big global multinationals. Um, some of them would make, you know, the names you'd be like, oh, not that company. <laughs> and then I know people that, you know, are, li are like folks in this room, working hand to mouth on corn. Um, seed companies are not, should not be, the, and are not the bastions of preservation. And they're not the bastions of revival. We occasionally are able to foster a preservation project or bring one or two wonderful things back. But those one or two things are like tips of icebergs, exponential icebergs, okay? And partly because the customer base, I'm trying to sell stuff to you. You really can't fathom 20 different types of corn if I'm trying to explain to you how awesome each one of them is. It, you know, I can basically sell you maybe four and make it worth time to keep people employed to come to the shop to work. So when I'm dealing with money, money's about math. Corn isn't really, doesn't really care about that. Corn, be, corn actually like cares about taking care of people. Corn cares about like the longevity. Its genetics are built upon a 10,000 year, you know, interaction with human beings. We've got, we've got 50 years of corn improvement basically where hybrids became dominant. So those 50 years, we basically tossed out 10,000 years worth of interaction. That's a rough thing. Mm -hmm. We've also tossed away a lot of our understanding of how all these individual, all these the unique varieties look, work, feel, taste, whether they were good to start with, some of them weren't, some of them were worth tossing out, many of them were worth keeping. So we've lost, you know, our culture in, in our own way uh, we were taking care of corn to a certain extent and it was taking care of us and there are people taking care of it but they're really you know they're, everyone I've ever met who's a plant breeder loves the crops that they work in and loves the diversity and has a huge amount of respect for all of the history and heirlooms and many of them are maintaining these little pieces of this as best they can but when you're maintaining something, it's more like an orphanage rather than a family. You've got a lot of children that aren't getting taken care of that you're doing your best to feed. And these things need homes. You know, one or two plants or, you know, a little plot here or there, like once every 10 years, is not taking care of the crop. And it can't take care of you. It's not being allowed to, and we don't have a society that fosters that care. And 
as a lot of, you know, as Albie was saying, a lot of folks that have been taking care of that or had family tradition of taking care of that have passed on or are passing on because our society doesn't really have a metric for, you know, growing corn, heirloom corn on expensive farmland in Rhode Island <laughs> and paying the taxes. We aren't making an allowance in our world and we we are the only ones that can make that change. We are the only ones that can make that change. Don't expect politicians to make that change. Don't expect seed companies to make that change. Seed companies can be partners. They can be great um, like public ways of telling stories through examples. You know, using something like the Abenaki Flint as an example to tell the story of the work that's required and the value that it has to our communities is super important. Okay? Like wouldn't would never have wanted to not have that project be part of my life if what little bit I've been interacted with it. But that's the tip of the iceberg. And it really is gonna take it's you know, we have to ask ourselves, is it okay that you know, I talked to the folks at the Grin the ARS Grin, which is the it's just the germplasm repository in the United States, and I asked them for things, and oh, I asked for this uh, Blue Hubbard variety that's called Vermont Hubbard, and it was bred sometime back in the, I think the 20s, it's a, it was a breeding line that was a Hubbard squash that was like amazing and kept really well, and it just kind of Hubbard squash, as we all know, is no longer popular because it's huge and what other, lots of reasons. Well, they had some samples still, I thought, in the deep freeze in a place called Fort Collins, which they don't let samples out unless they're really sure you're going to actually do something with. You know, like you have to actually be a researcher or a scientist or somebody who works for a seed company. And I was like, can we? Can I get some of these seeds? And there's like, well, there's a process. Yeah, no problem. Understand. Uh, Larry Robertson, who used to be a curator for squash for the ARS Grin, who's now passed away. Um, the seed was dead. There's no more of that, okay? I've been able to track down a sample in the German version of that type of germplasm. But like, some of these seeds still exist, but a lot of them are dead. And a lot of them are gonna die every day. And the folks that are taking care of them are gonna die every day for the next 50 years until they're gone. There's only so much cryogenic freezing that seeds are viable for. Some of these seeds are placed in these you know, in this liquid nitrogen or whatever the heck it's in, from back in the 60s. You know, some of it's been in storage for 30 or 40 years. And, you know, seeds are sleep. In your culture and in my culture, seeds are actually fully formed plants. They're not, they're, they're, they're like, the plant is actually fully formed. It's just a sleeping baby. So in a lot of cultures, there's an understanding that seeds are asleep, they're children. They're asleep in consciousness. So um, uh, Jewish culture has an Aleph, which is the primary beginner of the alphabet, which is, which is uh, sleeping cult, basically uh, like a sleeping consciousness. And this, the seed is the emblem, sort of the model for that. And that's in a bunch of different cultures, whether it's Irish or Native American or however. Yes? You know if they say the genome? They save the DNA from those plants. One that seeds are no longer viable. One could s take the, the DNA and transplant mm -hmm. it into another seed, which would then germinate with that genome. Are they just tossing the seeds? It has, to, it has to be alive, and that's not. <coughs> it's not really a thing. Let's just I, I say that. what I'm saying is they're not yeah. doing that. That at least, I mean, you, we could bring back the passenger pigeon if we had enough money to do but, it. But you, okay, you're saying but we could, there's, I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying you're, like, in theory, somebody could do that, but not. Like that's, uh, what but, I'm saying but that's, is if, but, if they but, didn't save the DNA, then that's lost forever. Let, let, me, let me be clear. Everybody in this room, when you're reading about cloning and things were messing around with CRISPR and things like that, that stuff is super hard. Okay, like it's actually like when you read one paper about someone who figured out how to do it once, you can't afford to do that. Like there's no funding to do that thing that took somebody like 
15 years to figure out how to do it once. And every variety is going to be different. There's tricks. It's not a generic thing, just like corn is different. That one variety may be, well, what about the other 50 or 60 varieties that are dead? Every one of those gene strands is going to be a different challenge. So sure, but if they throw it away, then it's definitely lost. Mm. So they hadn't thrown it away. I talked to them about it. But when a seed is at a dead point, there's a determination of what the focus is, whether it's valuable, what it's, whether it's useful, whether there's a potential for it to ever be preserved in some elaborate technique that costs $10,000 per variety to even attempt, let alone succeed at. This is like, that could cost 100 grand for just that one variety. And I'm not going to pay that money, and they're not going to pay that money. They got 100 grand probably for like the entire department. Maybe they got 300 grand for the entire, you know, for the entire staff budget for some of these places. So they can't justify that money. Money doesn't come out of thin air. It has to come from somewhere. It's not coming from our tax dollars because all this stuff has been underfunded, defunded, successively, successively, successively. They're at this point sort of desperately <coughs> hoping that, you know, people who work in the seed companies are starting to pull some of these things out and try to bring what can be brought back. And there's plenty of stuff that's viable, but some of the stuff isn't. And when it's lost, it's lost. So there are things that are lost. Those things are going to be an almost nearly impossible to return. And that's like a grief, I think. Like, it's a real cultural grief. But we don't really feel it because there's still food in the, sh there's still food in the stores. You know, one of the, like, so Stewart's mm -hmm. will, so like, one of the things to think about with corn is Hobie Blue isn't really adapted to this part of the country. It's too long to mature, in my opinion. So it's really susceptible to Stewart's wilt, which is a virus disease carried by uh, bacterial disease. Bacterial disease, mm -hmm. I think, carried by um, flea beetles, uh, leaf hoppers. Uh, no, flea beetles. Flea beetles. And I've seen this. We just saw it last year in a trial plan. Um, it's it's like that disease almost wiped out all corn production in the United States in the 70s because the genome of corn was had been for inbreds for hybrids was so narrow that Stewart's wilts and other diseases almost like wiped out all of our corn production we were on the like potential like crisis mode but somebody remembered that there was this type of corn called gourd seed corn mm -hmm. which you guys call grandfather corn I think correct no we call it uh, teat corn okay yeah and it's like basically got a husk on it it looks like almost oh, like the wheat. pod corn the pod corn the bloom it's, corn yeah it's not it's not not board corn not the, the pod corn pod corn yeah. sorry yeah so there's That's this grandpa corn grandpa corn yeah so it has a it, it look it's very what we would well you know we like to use these words primitive <laughs> it's very quote <laughs> primitive corn basically it's still got a little husk on the kernel the kernel has paper that covers it. Well, this and this other type of gourd seed corn had the disease resistance, and somebody found it. I don't know, it was like on some farm in like Louisiana or something. Somebody in some place was still growing this variety. Saved the world. Mm -hmm. Pretty much. Just the fact that that one person was still, that like two farms were still growing this corn. But you, it's difficult to do that. We keep going back to the piggy bank, and the thing that keeps happening is, gosh darn it, when Vavilov was running down the world in the 20s or whenever he was running around saying, like, look at all the origins of crops, these cultures were still intact. They were still doing the selection work. They were still growing their seeds. We could still show up at their village and be like, cool, that's disease resistant. Thanks for taking care of that. Back to the United States with it. Fist bump. Let's breed some stuff. Now, we go back to that village, and the village ain't growing any of that stuff anymore. <coughs> the village may not even exist anymore because of all the various different pressures that modern society has placed upon all of these countries and all of these cultures. They're not, they're, they're challenged to grow their own food. Uh, all the political craziness that's happened and colonization and basically destruction of everyone's government and the drawing of all kinds of lines all over the globe, like, most of these societies aren't maintaining their own, are, are not able to maintain this stuff. And we were just thinking that we were going to like, you know, invent washing machines and the world wasn't going to change. But it changed. And a lot of people have lost their traditional uh, plant, like, cultures. And uh, then we were like, well, maybe we can put this stuff in a germ bank 
and we can like take care of it and like, you know, that'll fix everything. Well, guess what? That hasn't really worked either. So we've been running around trying to figure out how we're going to outbreed all the diseases that are basically going to make that constantly we have to breed new wheat, constantly have to breed this new crop, constantly we got to look for this new disease resistance. Constantly we got to look for this thing. Oh, it takes time, it takes money. We got lazy, we decided to start genetically engineering everything. Because I can say, you know, you know, so Luther Burbank was, everyone thought the guy was crazy because he would actually make the 10,000 crosses between the wild thing and the other thing and the one thing that took, he actually was smart enough to pick it out. Nobody wants to spend 15 years making 10,000 crosses anymore. You know, Luther Burbank was a madman. In a, in, I don't mean that in a derogatory way. Like most of us would say that attention to detail is maddening. But he was able to figure out what was what and was able to draw in all these different things from wild crops and domestic crops. And everybody else started doing that too. And it's a ton of work. It's way easier to put some stuff from a cell from another cell and boom. But the consequences of that are, again, plants will do what we want them to do. Like we're, we're in a rush. We're in a hurry to our own demise. We're like rushing to our own demise. Okay, so like agriculture, there was somebody, somebody did a study at Cornell about like the ratio of the amount of money that we spend on pesticides how much they cost, and then what the health care costs are of them, and how much crop damage is being done. And basically, like, the dollar amount was the same. Like, the cost of the, this was just like regular people doing this. It wasn't like hippies trying to look for, like, you know, how toxic everything is. These were like professors being like, yeah, we're spending, like, whatever, I don't know, $8 billion on health issues, and we're spending $8 billion on pesticides, and, like, we're still losing 30% of our crops to damage. This is in 2003 or something, whatever they did the study. It's like, we are not, we are like, the food supply appears to be like pretty stable. Because in a society where you think the food supply is not stable, there's outright panic. Yeah. You know, banks get runs on things like the economy. People don't have, people don't have trust in money when there's no food. <laughs> so, you know, that's why the Germans were like, inflation, but like, we make sure the rich people have wine, you know. We're good, you know, like all the way through the war, like make sure people have cheese, like the cheese and wine ran out, people freaked out, you know, that's, that was kind of like, hey, we can kind of maintain this like crazy fascist regime if we can like keep some of the things that people think are whatever. In our society, our food supply is very tenuous. The food supply in the world has always been tenuous. It's because food takes care. Mm -hmm. Like food takes care of us, it requires us to care for it. And we are caring for it, but the way that we are asking the plant to care and the way that we're asking, that we're caring for the plant is having consequences. And we have to be very cognizant that like this is not necessarily, if this is the ideal, if we're at like the pinnacle of human existence, we got a problem. I'm like, I think that we should not see this as the pinnacle of human existence. I don't think we should see this moment as like apex of sustainability. Okay? And this is like a, I don't think the last 50 years have been sustainable for a lot of people. Is this 50 years of progress sustainable for another 50 to 100 years? Is this progress? You know, we're, we're being fascinated by this, but the question is, who is going to grow this food, people? Who's going to grow this food? If we're going to rely upon 1% of the population to grow food, they're going to have to throw chemicals at it. They don't have time to take care of food. It's like, we, you know, I, I'm not going to demonize someone who's being, for, who's being asked to take care of an ever-increasing amount of acreage because the rest of us want to, like, go have fun. You know, that's basically what's happening. There's no magic bullet. It's that it is the all hands on deck mentality that cultures had with food. The reason I have two chairs here, this is like an old thing. Old days, old ways, 
<laughs> so this represents the next, next generation, or this represents you being here talking about corn in 20 years. This is you, or this is the person that was here talking about corn who's now passed on. In a society, in all societies, this is how society works. The old people are sitting around grading because they're the ones who know the most about seed and corn, and so they're the ones grading the corn. Okay, and the kids, just like outside, they're kind of like playing in the dander. And the old people are like, hey, this is a good barley. See this? This is good. Or this is a good corn. See this? This is what it looks like. If you're raised in that, if that's your village, if that's your clan, boom. Okay? And so those folks who are old, they've seen 50, 60, 70, 100 harvests. They've seen the variability of weather. They've seen what every disease could possibly look like they're going to see in their realm. They're going to know which seeds and which plants because they've passed that on from generation to generation to generation. Building six or seven hundred years of understanding crop through generations. But when a disease hits or there's challenges, guess who are the fo first folks to die in a society? The children and the old people. So immediately you've trimmed off like the learning and the passing on. You do that for 50 years or 100 years, the society doesn't know up from down pretty quick. You know, we like to send our old people to old folks, folks homes, and we like to send, send our, we like to make, you know, send our young kids to preschool. They don't ever see each other. You know, there's, there's some things about how society erodes, every society. Our society, Steve's society, folks in Africa and different places, folks wherever. There's a commonality in how, you dis how people's societies erode from information transformation. My family's culture in Ireland, same thing. Boom. You can break the strain, you can break something really easily. It's harder to put it back together or hard to build it again. But once you build it, once you use the momentum, this stuff does roll. The plants, the, s the corn wants to be saved. The corn wants us to grow it. It's pretty, it's pretty obvious that like this stuff wants us to grow. But yeah, it doesn't work with machines. You know, it's not gonna work that way. So then what? You know, so yeah, it's like step up, we gotta do something about this. I don't know what the answer is to all of the challenges, but I think just understanding that there is something that you and I can do is important. And I think the other part is everyone's thinking someone else is doing this. Everyone thinks that Albie or Steve are basically gonna like keep this stuff for us so I can sleep at night knowing everything's okay. That's just not realistic. Because every day these folks that have been trying to maintain these collections are passing away. Like they've been kicking the bucket left and right. And Seed Savers Exchange, a bunch of the members that have been like solid, you know, saving them, you know, their collections in the freezer. You know, you leave that stuff alone, who knows, it gets thrown out. Yeah, I don't, you know, who knows? Next thing you know, it's in the, in the dump. That just, that just, ha or it gets sent to another collector who's already overwhelmed with their collection and can't really take care of it. And they got to cherry pick the 10 things they can really take care of out of the 400 things. And it's just like, it's becoming a sort of a uh, undoable thing. And, and like, I'm saying this when folks are going to think some folks wrongly assume I'm one of those people. Yeah, I, surely. I've got a ton of things I'm trying to take care of. And, but, because, and because I do. But, I, I, you know, you're thinking I'm, the, like, I'm able to do this. Let me explain. When I was 21, I got uh, very ill and was hospitalized with an autoimmune disease, which I've been struggling with my entire life. Like, I wasn't sure next, last year at this time, I was not sure I was going to be able to keep farming. And all of the work that I have done, I was basically did not have a, did not have a 20s. Like if you're thinking you're healthy and happy, like I went in the hospital weighing like, you know, reasonable weight. I weigh 200 pounds now. I came out weighing 114 pounds. 
Okay, that's not that's not good. I couldn't take care of myself. Basically, didn't have like a you know young fun twenties, but like I still like plants. I couldn't really do anything. Like I was pretty much screwed up. My buddy had a farm. And I'd worked on my parents' gardens, and I hated gardening. And, oh, God, you know, I wanted to get the hell out of there as fast as I could, you know. <laughs> go to the city, drive Cadillacs, whatever, you know. <laughs> and but I, that didn't happen. And there I am, like, totally useless and, like, not doing well. And I'm like, I just, you know, you're sitting around, like, totally sick, and your brain is just, like, going all the time. Like, I need something to do. So I was like, yeah. I, I was like, hey, can I come over to your farm and, like, work for free? <laughs> And just like weed things and go home, like just be there four hours a day, no expectations. The guy was like, sure. Free work. Guy knows what a weed is versus a tomato plant. <laughs> sure. So I went over to my buddy's place and I did that and it really, you know, I just like, was like, yeah, I guess I do understand this stuff. This is cool, whatever, you know. And I was like, at the end of the day, I went to work, I was feeling like totally, you know, miserable. And I came out of that day like kind of processing all my stuff and I went home and I was like, I feel great. Mm -hmm. This is a good thing. I want to do more of this, you know, like, huh, what about this, you know, and, but I, you know, so for me it was just like, I couldn't travel, you know, I wanted to travel the world. I can't travel the world. I can't get vaccinations to allow me to travel beyond like basically my, this country. Um, that's just the way it is. So, you know, I can't go to Italy. I can't really, currently because it's just like, I don't know when I'm going to get screwed up, you know? So like, I don't know when I'm just going to, oh, going to be out, out, out for the count for a week. Who knows? Um, most of the time it's fine, but you know, you just never know. So I was like, I want to grow all these seeds from all these different places because I can't go there. Okay. So that's how I first started getting into this, was just like wanting to travel through my garden, you know? And then I realized that this stuff needed, was like seed saving is fun and it's really easy and like there's seeds coming out of your head, you know, whatever, like really, you know, pretty much like instantaneously you can do some cool stuff. And that, you know, you just, it's pretty easy. You just need a few like, mentor type folks to ask some key questions to get like oh timing okay how and what's this and you just kind of bounce some things off folks that you know might be doing it or or just reading old books or just kind of you know starting to form the community with other folks that haven't been doing it other folks are so friggin like need young people that if you call them and you're like i'm interested in saving you're like oh my god let me tell you everything i know <laughs> like I'm so desperate for someone to talk to about the thing I'm interested in for the last 20 years. <laughs> let me just like tell you everything I know. And he's like, whoa. You know, and they're like, let me give you all these seed samples. And you know, like, God, thank God there's one of us. We can just like, you know, they're so desperate. And the university people are the same way. You call them on their phone, they're like in their office, like, hello, Dr. So and so. And you're like, I was calling you about your like fava bean thing. And they're like, oh my God. Somebody's <laughs> called me about my fava beans. <laughs> And they're just like, I'm going to unload all my fava bean like, knowledge on you right now, you know. <laughs> and you're like, whoa! <laughs> so it, it's like kind of overwhelming because the floodgates are like that. It's not generally, like it's kind of an interesting thing because you hear about seed companies, intellectual property, and all these things that kind of like are the antithesis of this thing I'm saying. But that's kind of why it's such an antithesis. That's why, why for those of us in the seed community, it's kind of doesn't make sense because... We're just crazy about everything that we do and want to tell everyone about it. And here's these other people who are like, really want to do that, but like have signed non-disclosure contracts. And they're just like, oh, making diamonds all day. You know, like not happy. You know, they're really not. Uh, you know? So we're kind of, you know, we're kind of like, it's a fun thing. Tell your friends. We're having all the fun. <laughs> you know, that's cool, man. Like, it's the new thing. It's hip. That's why you're all here. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, it, it's it's a necessary thing. It's a wonderful skill. It's super engaging. It, like, <laughs> solves all your problems. Totally, right? Uh, <laughs> except it's not going to make you a lot of money. It's not going to make you money. But it will save you money because you'll be growing your own food. Mm. You're going to spend just as much mm -hmm. money because you're going to get, like, want to do more. 
<laughs> I'm just saying, like, it's not about the money. Let's just be honest. Like, it's not. Like, Fedco is a great company. I work there. We don't make a lot of profit. There's not a lot of profit to be made in seeds. That's why all these companies have been selling themselves to other people. If a company sells itself up the chain, it's about trying to extract like this little 1%. Someone's looking for the profit, and the shareholders are like, I want more profit, where's the profit? It's like, there's not a lot of profit in agriculture. There's just not. Because it's, even though, even though agriculture is this wonderful multiplying thing where you take like one seed and get like a billion seeds, it's just still not that profitable. It's just a baseline thing. It's just not, it's profitable in the sense that if you value not starving to death, like that should be the most profitable thing, you know, duh, that's invaluable. It's both worthless and priceless. Yeah. You know, it's about your life. You know, it's not about anything other than like the core of what we're supposed to do as, as human beings. You know, I ate that, it didn't kill me, I wanna grow that. <laughs> You know, straight up hunter-gatherers come farmer mentality. That was good. I want more of that. You know, and we try to figure out why seeds like, you know, heirloom seeds haven't made it into our society. It's like, look at all the other things that have been value that just like disappeared. Look at all the other things in the world that don't have a place. You know, like there's so many things that don't, you can't, that like the dollar sign just doesn't affect. You know, we think we're the only, we think that math, and I'm certainly crapping on math, like math is cool, <laughs> but we have a society based on this, this concept of, of money. So like I told Alvy the story about how basically like the, when I say Inca, like basically Inca society was like the sort of end game of all of a very complex society that was already in existence. It was like kind of like a, uh, that's a, you know, it's how like a re lineage of kings sort of towards the end of the deal. Um, but like th they, had, they had a number system based on zero. Like there's only been like three whatever cultures that have had zero. They, they had figured that out. They also had like basically a whole like metric system and a bunch of stuff that they, basically the Spanish were like totally showed up and were like this place is Bahal. Like, mm -hmm. This is the most amazing thing we've ever seen in our lives. Whatever, that it took, it took them 50 years to finally conquer them, you know. Um, but that 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 society had math, but the crops were grown and then shared. They went into like common storage. Okay, like they were keeping track of everything. You know, because you can't really improve things without keeping track of things. So, like, one of the things people don't know about corn is that everyone's like, how did these primitive people breed this amazing thing that, like, we've spent the last hundred years trying to understand and we've only improved it like a fingernail out of, like, this much craziness that folks have spent time doing it. Well, because, like, yeah, they had math. They you had a whole way of like using strings as kipu counting thing. It's pretty cool. You should look into it. You can be like that ear of corn, that particular ear has this many rows. I'm gonna plant all the seeds. I'm gonna keep track of each one of the seeds. I'm gonna keep track of how many ears each one of those seeds. That's what that's what I meant by it has a language. Yep. And so you, you speak their language. You can communicate. Yeah. You know all those things. So they're working with the plant? Mm -hmm. But, you know, just like no plant has ever not given seeds to someone because of their gender <laughs> or their race, reach out your hand, that plant gives to you. You know, it's like, hey, when you start working the way that works, you know, you're like, food's a common thing, man. You know, there's no, like, mine, yours, food. It's like, you know, people are always like, telling these stories, you know, when col colonialists got them, and it came here and they're always like, yeah, we were friendly with the Native American people and then they just like walked through our door and they were like, hungry, I'm gonna eat some of your food. And we're like, you can't do that. Mm -hmm. so that's another, that's like in uh, uh, advanced society,
food does not have ownership. <coughs> food is common. If you're starving to death <coughs> and you need a drink of water or you need a loaf of piece of bread, you just it wasn't like you know, you didn't like feel like you were being a jerk by walking into someone's house and being like, I need an apple. <coughs> you know? Like totally acceptable. You weren't gonna like steal it. you weren't gonna like no, whatever, like ruin their house or something, but eating someone's food was kind of like, actually kind of a compliment. You came to their house, they had enough to give to you. They knew that you had enough to give to them. That's like kind of a thing. It means like, you know, they didn't go to the other person's house because they didn't have anything, but you, because you're smart and prosperous, I was able to get some food from you. So there's like a whole way of how we see food affects how we see seeds. And it affects how we work with seeds, it affects what we select for, it affects a lot of things. I'm sort of like, I didn't really know quite what I was going to say because I wasn't quite sure what everyone else was going to say today. So I said this. <laughs> so that's what I said. Can you talk about the tillering and the nitrogen fixing? Yeah. So corn's got this bad rap as being like totally addicted to nitrogen. Um, and that it's like horrible for our environment. Remember what I was saying, we bred it to do that. We bred it to be this like monoculture thing. And we've, at, we've basically planted it that way. It didn't ask us to plant it that way. We planted it that way. We bred it that way, okay? Originally, there's been some discoveries recently and they're like, you know, corn has this weird thing that some varieties, they like make this little exudate stuff that drips off of some of these kind of aerial roots that has, that like feeds bacteria in the soil that produce nitrogen. And we just didn't pay attention to that about 200 years ago when we just basically like destroyed our germ, our germ, our, our gene pool. Turns out that corn, yeah, needs food, but also has like a relationship of bacteria in soil that it hasn't been sterilized. Oh, so, so soil that hasn't been sterilized with all kinds of herbicides and stuff apparently has like, there's stuff going on. It's got a gut biome like we do. And the corn has an interaction and has a way of taking the sugar that it's making through photosynthesis and encouraging certain types of bacteria. And I'm using the word corn because it's only certain kinds of corn that have do are, that are doing that. It's not like all corn, because we're not, we didn't ask the corn that we're growing to do that. But corn does the, can do that. And so when we ask or when we say these things about corn, we're basically saying these things like just as a wake up call, like, does everyone know like what our sacred cow is? If Steve's culture, <coughs> the corn is, its, is really like its central part. Our sacred cow is the cow. Mm. If you're white and Germanic in origin, your sacred cow is the cow. Our whole culture was based upon taking care of dairy cows. Like we have kind of taken our sacred cow and turned it into like, you know, this thing. When I say this, I can tell you the root words of all the words in the family are, what's the word mother derived from? Mutir, which is butter. The woman who makes the butter. Okay, what is the word father derived from? It's from the word fodder. His responsibility is to get food for the cows. Where does the word brother come from? It comes from the word brothel, which is the barn. It's not a prostitution. You've taken that word and made it into something else. That guy's job is to clean out the stalls, man. The daughter. Daughter is the cow. Like in the old days, cows were both like let to run free, like as a group herd. You, it still happens and still was happening in many countries up until just even like a decade ago. Some cultures still have a thing where everybody goes out, all their cows go into a big herd, they go out grazing and they bring them back. And everyone knows who their cows are because they're part of the family. And the cows know exactly where to go. There's no fences. They go right back to the family that takes care of them. Nobody has to beat them. The cows are like, going home. They come home at a certain time. They don't even really have to be taken care of. The folks that go out who milk the, who milk the cows and who, in some cultures, who um, find the herb that would curdle milk um, to make various things, daughter, E-O-D-D-E-R, 
is like both doddering, which means to tie a cow to a, you know, to a chain, so it basically to a rope, because in some places there was so little grazing ground that like you kind of had to be like pick your spot, you know, kind of like kind of like rotational grazing. So for people who are tending the herds in some cultures, where are the young women? So there is this role, whether you want to, you know, rec I don't, I'm not acknowledging that as like gender roles. I'm just saying like we have a root for who we are. What we do to ourselves is what comes back to us. So when we don't know who we are, we start running around asking everyone else, you know, to give us what makes them them. So we have to be really clear, like, it's on us to figure out who we are. We have to do our work. That's really key. Like, food has a role in that. When we take care of corn, we've done a lot today to really acknowledge the role that Native Americans have had in this, you know, this <coughs> particular place. It's a very specific place, but like this crop. But like, okay, we also have to acknowledge our responsibility. We have to acknowledge like who we are and what we're gonna do. Like we have all cultural and clan roots. We all come from traditions. We are not without this past. We are not without origin. You know, let's, let's, let's respect ourselves. If we don't respect ourselves, we can't respect other people. You know, so there's a role in this for like, Acknowledging what we've done to our own sacred cow. And of course, you know, we're going to do the same thing to, to Steve's, you know, culture's core thing. Because we don't, we haven't sort of figured that out. The relationship is, is the same. So, you know, seeds are, are like children. They're our future. They're our past. They're like food every year, year to year. Uh, that's how it rolls, you know, like we can we can see little pretty packets with little pictures. That's like glam. I love it, you know, but like, you know, it's not, it's like, it's like, imagine it was totally boring. You'd still have to save seats. But it's not boring. Let go, man. That goes boring. <laughs> okay, you know. So my this is the thing. My son like says, "Dude, what is this thing you guys are doing with this catalog? There's no pictures. It's like black and white, you know." And I'm like, "Dude, look. Here's all the other catalogs. Great marketing tool. This one's in black and white. All the other ones are like totally glossed out color. It's like it totally shows up. Okay, like you know, it, you know, it's it, it found, and it requires you to read." Yes, I understand. <laughs> Challenges. And I'm not here today representing Fedco. I'm representing myself. Um, so, but yes, Fedco catalog is born. <laughs> so, that's what I got to say. Thank you. Thank you. And somebody. And somebody The, just like the, the the tillering plants, Heron was explaining to me that the tillering plants had a gene in them that they wanted to eliminate because it didn't allow for commercial production. So you eliminate the gene that has the tillering. But that was the gene that had the drip, drip, drip for nitrogen fixation. Mm -hmm. So if that's a metaphor for what we've done in general, it's a pretty powerful metaphor. Because it blew me away when he told me that. Because everything I've ever, ever, ever read about corn is what a horrible user of nitrogen it is. And suddenly you realize that back when people were growing corn without fertilizers, they didn't have the problem because it was built into the plant. I'm making this much too simplistic. But the idea that corn knew how to do that part of it to some degree. I was talking to one of your students who said that they had been in Mexico recently and I was reading about the sustainable plots in Mexico that have been growing for two, three, four thousand years without any of these extra ingredients yep. and the term is milpa. Yep. So if you could speak very, very briefly to that or 
Suzanne Morse would be much more, uh, my colleague in agroecology would be much more knowledgeable about the sustainability of agriculture. Um, would you? She can sit in this chair. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I realize just at the end of the day, but for me, that NOPA word yeah. was so, so critical to say, oh, you mean it's possible to grow sustainably in the same plot for a thousand years without all these extras that we thought were absolutely essential? Yeah. We think our agriculture requires all these things, and somehow other people have been feeding themselves for 5,000 <laughs> years without pesticides, without basically without pesticides. And I, I, one thing I do want to say this, like, so people are always kind of like challenged by society. So corn is our hermaphroditic plant. Okay, there's a lot of hermaphroditic plants. Corn is like an amazing hermaphroditic plant. It's like subcultures that recognize what a plant, what they're working with and bring something into their family have way less judgment about people's gender and sexuality. <coughs> There's a lot of cultures that like accept and have like a specific name and even like a sacred place for people that are transgender or that um, identify one way or the other or are gay or whatever because partly because of their understanding of plants. So that's something to know just like how we when we look at plants like there's so much there that like you just are not allowed to judge anything. You just really not. Like the plant is just not, doesn't have time. It doesn't have time. Yeah. You know, people don't have time, plants don't have time. It's a waste of time. But yeah, Suzanne, could you come up and talk? I'll sit with you, sit right there. Um. Because I'm not, you know, so <laughs> abandon me up there. <laughs> <laughs> it's a cold, cold, cold place. Sit in the rocking chair. It's a nice chair. Rocking chair. No rocking chair. Um, <laughs> <coughs> wow, the milpa. Well, there are different things that I would I think about uh, in the milpa. One, it's a polyculture. It's not just a monoculture of corn. Mm -hmm. And there was always legumes there that were also fixing the nitrogen. So yep. I think that it's something that, you know, it was an entire system. It wasn't just a single it's monoculture. Not yeah, it's not and the other thing was there were lots and lots and lots of leguminous trees around mm -hmm. also that were bordering the milpa. It wasn't just like you had these little pat, you had patches inside forests and there were a lot of leguminous trees and people systematically protected those leguminous trees. And so when a field was abandoned, leguminous trees would recolonize those fields. And so you had the leguminous trees fixing more nitrogen in those places. And so you had this very incredibly intelligent system that was set up that was related to the, the nutrient <coughs> management. And yes, they probably had these uh, relationships with fixing nitrogen, fixing bacteria in their roots. As the same thing, like sugarcane also has this really bad rap for really being a nitrogen demanding. And they found that bacteria grow inside the sugarcane in the stalks that actually fix nitrogen, but they will not do that if you give them lots of nitrogen. And so we, you know, we have, you know, once you create the, these monocultures and create conditions that don't allow those relationships to happen, <coughs> then they sort of, you know, they fall apart. And, and then what, what do you do with those? But so the MILPA to me is uh, a remarkable system that's also based on what is going on in the forest as well. That, that that agriculture is embedded in. Yeah. And can I just jump into the one, the other thing that Steve was talking today about the spiritual connection people have with the land. Mm -hmm. uh, among the Maya, at least that's the area that I'm most familiar with, um, there are numerous ceremonial aspects to um, the when you cut down a section of the forest to prepare for a milpa for mm -hmm. the three to five years that you would grow there. Mm -hmm. There's a whole series of asking permission of the owners of the land. Uh, and, and still in chilate or uh, corn gruel at the four corners. There's, there's a whole series of ceremonial um, aspects of how they engage with that. And it's very interesting. The other thing I was going to say um, about Milpa, at least in Guatemala, where I've worked most, it doesn't hurt to have volcanic soils. Oh, right. wow. <laughs> if, if, you're, if you're farming for a thousand years. Yeah. Um, so there, there, there are different milpa systems, like where, where Suzanne and I have worked in Yucatan. It's a karstic environment, and so 
they have to fallow for 20 to 25 years before they go back and mm -hmm. um, so it's a, it's a there are very different systems and diverse systems across um, Mesoamerica in terms of the kinds of ways that they grow it um, many of them require fallow and fire um, but others are um, long term with composting uh, from forested areas into areas close to but that sacred connection with uh, family plots is, <coughs> is still palpable, though disrupted by migration and other things. Would you spell Milpa? M-I-L-P-A. And you can be a Milpero, a person <laughs> in the Milpa. What is the um, word in your language for the Aztec word, nixtamalize? What word do you use, which is the Preparation of the wood ash. We just say ganostohare, uh, which means uh, to wash the corn. Mm -hmm. So it's, it, it describes the action. So in, in native cultures, everything is descriptive. Um, and it describes actions. That's how nicknames are gotten, too. <laughs> I had a friend who became goat bag. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question about that. Do you boil it with the wood ash? Because the original, uh, the uh, ancient cultures had wine. When the, one of the first things they found back in the days along with the pyramids were lime kilns to make lime, and quick lime. And in fact, until recently, in stores in Mexico, you could buy quick lime, which is a little crazy. But do you boil it? When you mix it with the wood ashes, you just wash it in wood ash solution. We use hard wood first of all. Yes. You have to use hard wood. Yep. So I guess it produces an acid like oak or uh, maple, and then uh, you gotta you gotta boil it. Okay. Until it gets boiling, and then and then you can test it, and you can see bubbles on the water, and then when you put the corn in the water in in a few minutes the corn will get all like a dark red orange yeah. and then when it gets ready it'll change back and all that will happen it doesn't take too long yeah because I, I do I do it just over. lime huh I just do it with agricultural lime yeah well but it's uh, the same thing changes color yeah and that's what releases the niacin yeah. well I, I don't know nothing about that yeah. but uh, I wouldn't mind to learn but I still <laughs> know the other way and even that uh, kind of knowledge is getting fewer and fewer yeah. because uh, a lot of people even in my in my town are into automatic corn <laughs> you know yeah. you can go buy that uh, bag of uh, massa there mm -hmm. but it's not even the same yeah. mm -hmm. but what's interesting that corns are actually they're all flint corn and mm -hmm. people people will assume that it's uh, it's um flour right. it, it isn't um, but just one other thing about uh, about the planting and uh, that I want to make some comments uh, to what uh, Heron said here earlier is that uh, our people always put fish in the garden, mm. you know? Mm -hmm. So just kept the cat from digging in your back porch or in your garbage can. Mm -hmm. But no, we all, they always <laughs> put the, uh, and uh, the fish, but the fish, uh, fish would, uh, what, what does the fish do? It breaks down quickly and it's the bone. So it's like mm -hmm. the source of bone meal, and that's what a lot of native people always did because they that nutrient is what produces the fruit. Mm -hmm. And so about uh, and one more quick thing about uh, what you said at the end. Well, our people always understood that corn is both male and female at the same time, and mm -hmm. uh, we have a ritual that uh, in the in the winter ceremonies where uh, corn, corn masks that are made of corn husk, uh, which we refer to them as beings, uh, appear in the winter ceremony. And, and what happens in there is that uh, the men dress up like women and women dress up like men. And it's got to do with the du duality of what you, what you had mentioned earlier. And it's, uh, s but even a lot of that old knowledge is uh, faded away but uh, they still continue to do those things uh, because uh, it's a uh, like it's a it's cultural it's cultural and so that deep understanding is still in, in the memory of older people 
but they still continue to do that and it's all about what he was mentioning so uh, and, and people don't not, like people are who are close to the in one way into the nature will understand it automatically you know mm -hmm. so I just wanted to make those comments mm -hmm. well, uh, thank on you, so much. Yeah. you had a question um, no uh, just a statement uh, along the lines of what Stephen said um, down where I'm from and the Algonquin people down there and, and the different tribes this time of year the shad bush is starting to blossom mm -hmm. starting to come out and when that happens then the shad come up and they come up and they come up into the coves and they, they come to the rivers a little bit and um, so what would happen is the men would go down and they would they would catch the shad bring it back and then put that into the hills mm -hmm. before we planted the corn and as that fish decomposed, it created heat, mm. okay? Mm. So that would warm the hills. So, you know, we could get our corn in there early. Mm. Uh, and, and of course, it, it provided fertilizer as well. Mm -hmm. This year, we went and we got some seaweed, mm -hmm. you know, so um, um, eelgrass type of seaweed. And we put that into our gardens this year to, s to see how, how that works when it starts to decompose, to see what, what, that, what that's about. But when we planted our corn, we used five corn kernels for each hill, and we plant one kernel for each sacred direction, the east and the south and the west and the north. And then the fifth, fifth kernel, we say we planted for the crow. And it was to honor to grow the crow because we believe the crow carried the corn from the southwest to us and in his beak, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, also, um, also because we know we'd probably be sharing some of our crop with the crow. <laughs> 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 you, you know, and, yes. and, that, and, and that's okay. But uh, as in other cultures too, it, it was a community, it was a, it was a family thing, a community thing to do. Mm -hmm. the, and the, we'd have the children, put the children to work. Uh, uh, putting them up in um, um, stands uh, on the hmm. border of of the uh, gardens, so that they could, you know, maybe throw little pebbles and stuff like that at the cre creatures mm -hmm. coming through to scare them off, you know. But but the women tended the fields mostly. Uh, where I'm from, they tended the fields mostly. The men would help with the heavy work. The women could do it. You know, it wasn't just super gender specific, but they they kind of went along those lines, you know. And the and the women um, uh, would sing, and they would sing to their their corn mm -hmm. and the different plants while they were while they were planting and while they were growing. You know, so that's we're we're excited because <coughs> this is the time of year, you know, mm -hmm. for corn. You know, so um, anyways, but I just wanted to add. That. That's wonderful. And most important, I'll be is that the old men still had a job because it was their job to chase the birds. So even if we retire, we still got something to do. If I will. When you go up the river less than a mile, when the Sandy <coughs> River comes in, draining the Rangeley Lakes region, um, the, old, the old point, which was the ancient village that went back maybe 3,000 years. Mm -hmm. Father Raw moved the village to this side because this was the French side of the river. It wasn't because mm -hmm. the people, as I understand it, wanted to be on this side. Mm -hmm. He wanted to be on the French side as a Jesuit priest, and the other side was somewhat under British control. But when you look across the river, if you go down this road to the big Catholic cemetery, at the end of the cemetery next to the river, is the Father Raw monument that was put up in the 1800s by the Bishop of Boston. And uh, um, when you look across the river, there's a power line. And to the left of the power line, there's an island that's right opposite the tip of the ancient cornfield on the other side of the river. And I, I've walked on that, and where the tip of the island comes in close, there's like a stone walkway, like from here to Conrad. And I always thought when I first looked at it that, oh, the loggers must have put that down. But much more recently, I've come to believe that that was a stone weir. And so the timing, the exquisite timing of nature, this is my belief. Uh, it's not 
not proved by anybody that I know, and mm -hmm. others will probably argue with me, but my sense is that the timing of the migration of the fish that would come up mm -hmm. the river could be herded into that narrow passageway between the island and mm -hmm. the, the, the tip of the, the Sandy River, and those rocks would allow the fish to be stopped there, and then they could be pushed into a, a density, and they could be they could be speared or netted, and then it was just literally from here to that wall to go up over the bank, and you were in the cornfield. Mm -hmm. uh, Skowhegan translates roughly into the watching place, and there's a big mural of a native man standing with his spear in hand, and mm -hmm. Cecilia was very helpful talking about the suffixes of the name and places in New Brunswick that have, in her language, uh, similar endings. And they all, tell me if I'm doing this wrong, or you take over, please. Well, yes, the, the word uh, es Eskin, or Skonovidich, as we call it. Skonovidich is in, uh, it's on the coast in, in New Brunswick. Uh, it means the place where you're waiting and watching. And so when Albie and I first talked about this, um, I had asked him, you know, what he thought that Skowhegan meant, and, and that was where the discussion came from. And on that note, uh, what was interesting about the, just, just interesting that we've met like this, but the word Nor Norwijawak, I believe uh, we talked about that as well. It's in our language for the Wabanagi, uh, we say Nawijawak. And now would you walk means where the two rivers come down and meet. Mm -hmm. And it's a portage route. So when we say now would you walk, and what's interesting is that that's where I live, is I live in now would you walk in New Brunswick. Mm -hmm. So Albie and I, and we live in the same place. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. And I think the soil, the soil is really specific to this, is that when you're talking about a river or a bottle of water, um, earlier, we talked about a farm that a fellow named Jay Robinson um, maintain, has over in uh, Starks. And literally, you can pretty much reach your hand right into the silt and go like practically to your elbow without a rototiller. Hmm. You know? So, uh, Native people weren't stupid, as we <laughs> are, I think, under, uh, totally in agreement. Um, hey, there's fish. And this is the best soil. There's, and you go from there, fertilizer to growing a crop. Uh, Clarence Day um, wrote uh, two books that were like these, I, I I'm not sure if they were like a master's thesis or what the deal was with them, but basically they're like histories of Maine agriculture. For one of them starts in like 1602 and goes to like pre-Civil War. And he talks about using all the different references like where all of these <coughs> huge cornfields were that folks were farming, Native American folks were farming. And you know, there's whatever, 1,000 acres here and 750 acres here of corn. Like this is not, this is not like, you know, s small scale stuff. And then there's a different type of farming that he describes where folks were doing a version of what we've called slash and burn agriculture. But, the, the, but there was no weeds. So when you burn a forest, a section of a forest and chop trees down, let them rot. That ground is like basically does have no weeds. And you can continue to grow in that soil for a number of years. And the first settlers who settled inland away from rivers copied this technique and were growing corn with no weeds for a very long time. And it wasn't until people came in, there was a second wave. There's sort of these folks that were kind of like, settlers who were like living in little homesteads here and there and they were perfectly happy with this kind of hand-to-mouth existence to a certain extent because they were kind of outside of the you know king's law you know and then at a certain point people came in and like you know cleared the land and actually sowed you know grass and stuff to feed cows but there, there's a really funny story they basically they would they grow corn and then they like take their crop to town and the guy was telling a story about how he was just like shucking corn all night, just dry corn, trying to get it ready for to take to market. And there was like a bear that had gotten really hungry and was 
eating the other side of the pile as he was shucking <laughs> the corn. But he was too tired to scare the bear away, and the bear was too hungry to care about him. So he just kept shucking corn, and the bear just kept eating, and they basically did this for a week, and the bear got what the bear wanted, and he got some corn, and it was all good. But So there was a couple different forms of agriculture utilizing like the best alluvial plain soil that we have in Maine that runs down these various different rivers. And you'll just, just driving right down here, you'll see one of those completely flat alluvial <coughs> silt plain soils. You know, it, when, when mm -hmm. there's, there's sort of an interesting story of somebody turning a bunch of muddy soil over and uh, some native folks walking by and them going like, what are you doing with that horrible soil? You're trying to grow something in that? That's a bad idea. It was like, I got a plow. I was like, well, that doesn't matter. <laughs> like, <laughs> that's not soil. That, like, this is a fool's errand right there, buddy. You know. <laughs> you know. So like, you know, they were, it's funny how we've kind of chosen in Maine to, you know, we're we have. You can see the agriculture through here. You can see the cornfields that are growing modern corn right down <coughs> right over there. I mean, that that is one of those fields. That's that's one of the fields that corn is being grown. And, so folks, if you want to read some of that stuff about Maine specifically, uh, that book by Clarence Day, is, I th and you can get it through Interloan Library, because that's where I got it originally. And I think it's like 1602 to like 1860 is the first book, and the second book is like 1860, 1960 or something. What is the title? I can't, I, th I think it's just called A History of Maine Agriculture, but if you look, uh, I think you just Google Clarence A. Day, in history of agriculture, we'll check it out. Two <coughs> volumes, yeah. One's called history of agriculture, one's called history of farming. There you go. Mm. Um, uh, the day this woman says that it was the cows that were spreading the grass and the weeds and the corn. corn. Mm -hmm. So it's the two, the two Confluence. iconic. Um, the class of the two iconic. Looking for grazing weeds. ground, looking for far, looking for cornland. They were fenced yeah. out of the the English fields, and so they were. On the, on the Indian corn ground, grazing and, and spreading the corn, the grass seed and wheat seed. Yeah. Well, the word farmland comes from a place called Barmland. That's the place. The place called Barmland. It's in Denmark or Sweden, Swedish. someplace. Yeah, Sweden. That's where the. That's like where we were looking for our land of milk and honey. That's what our ethos is: the land of milk and honey. Mm -hmm. So we're looking for this place, perfect place. Farmland comes from this idyllic place where white people were kind of basically hanging out for about 12,000 years. So that's, like, you know, that's a good reference point. Thank you, thank you.